welcome back to Commissioner's Corner. I'm Charlotte Garrido, and I'm joined today by Chris Dunnigan cool. and Kathy Peters. Chris, as you know, is a longtime reporter for the Kitsap Sun, and he's retired now, but he continues to write uh, really wonderful articles. And Kathy is the Natural Resources Coordinator for Kitsap County in the Department of Community Development. Thank you both for being here today. I'm so looking forward to this conversation about Puget Sound. Um, and in specifically, we're going to talk about the new act, the Promoting United Government Efforts to Save Our Sound, Puget SOS, which was introduced by C Congressman Derek Kilmer and Congressman Denny Heck. They've held a couple of congressional hearings in the Puget Sound area, and I've attended uh, at least two of them. Uh, one was to preserve the health and beauty of the Pet Puget Sound, and uh, and the other one was the role of stormwater in recovery. The first one was really get, bringing together uh, state and local and tribal governments to understand better how we could work with the federal government. And then the second one was, of course, about stormwater. And the most powerful piece of that second one was a very short video of salmon. And when stormwater is introduced into the water they swim in, uh, how quickly they react and um, and die. Mm -hmm. um, it was a very powerful and, and very short message, but um, extremely valuable for, for all of us to be able to see. So we're talking about Puget Sound. Chris, you've written about this a certain amount over the years. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what Puget Sound is? Puget Sound is an estuary, a large, rather large estuary, but it's also a collection of smaller estuaries, and every one of these smaller estuaries is unique in itself. They have their own species, and they have their own water quality, and they have their own sediments. It all comes together, and each one is sort of a um, miniature ecosystem in itself. So um, overall, we've got one of the, well, it is the deepest estuary in the United States, and if you take the volume of water that's in Puget Sound, it's a larger volume of water than any body of water in the, un in the lower 48. Wow. Well, that's instructive. So these micro um, estuaries, hab estuaries, habitats. So where, where do I observe one that's different than another? Well, there's been a lot of studies, and so the, the research goes into the estuaries, and kind of one way of looking at it is to start at the bottom of the food web, and you look at the um, benthic creatures that, that lives in the mud. The bugs? They become, yeah, the bugs, and they become the bottom of the food web that everything eats that, and then, um, you know, of course, they're eat, they eat the plankton, and then it kind of builds up through the food web, and you'll have fish, marine mammals, and kind of the top in our um, area are the killer whales, the orcas, which um, we're very lucky to have mm -hmm. um, orcas in our area that we can see almost any time when they're around. I don't see him almost any time, but I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you, riding on the ferries and, and being able to observe those beautiful, beautiful whales is, is something. But probably the most um, beautiful occasion was I was out visiting folks at Southworth uh, last year, and we were having a, a very, uh, it was a large group of people who wanted me to see some problems in, in their beach area. And we were down on the beach just kind of, they were walking me around and, and uh, showing me some of the, the problem areas. And we've been doing that for maybe 20 or 30 minutes. And all of a sudden, I don't know how many whales, they, do, they would just breach and dive and breach and dive. They were I mean, there must have been 15 of them. And you hear their breath? They were a little further oh. out. I've heard their breath when they were in. in it's amazing. Yeah, it's, but they're so beautiful. And it just changes. I mean, it's this natural occurring mammal habitat is something that when, when they actually show themselves, changes all discussion. And we're all in awe just observing them and, and what, what, they are, what they are doing in, in the world. So. Um, we know they're endangered. I mean, I don't know if we need to get into that, but... Yes, we do. Okay. I was going to ask okay. you. I w actually, I was going to point out, um, I, I imagine that some people watching, um, but maybe not everybody knows that you've written a lot about um, environmental issues over the years, and 
Some years ago, uh, you did a number of articles about Hood Canal. And then those articles were gathered into a volume and published as a book. Correct. Hood Canal, Splendor at Risk. Correct. And, um, and you were writing about something that, that, was 20, that was in 1991. And you were writing about it um, in a very uh, progressive way for the time. We've learned an awful lot more since then. Um, and so I'm wondering, you're saying that we had splendor at risk in Hood Canal, and now you're saying we have it at risk in Puget Sound. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, the Splendor at Risk book started out as a series of newspaper articles. Mm -hmm. We did one series for a mo each month for a full year, and then we compiled those into a book. And it the, what we did was we picked a location in Hood Canal that we were interested in and what it was that feature about that, whether it was wetlands, water quality, um, logging. Um, we went into development and you know went up to Hansville and talked. There was a large development going on. So we covered all these different issues and how they infect, how they affect the environment. And um, in the end, we kind of came to some conclusions and recommendations about what should be done to help um, protect Hood Canal for the future. And Hood Canal remains, um, you know, one of the most pristine places that we have because development has not taken over yet. And so now the challenge is to apply some of those same findings and continue the research as we have through the years and find out what it is that the problem is in a certain area and then try to um, you know, do some restoration or protection, whatever we can do to um, improve that area for ourselves and all of the creatures that live there. I love how tenacious you are about this topic and about when aspects of it intrigue you, how you dig deep into um, why it's, it's the way that it is and help the rest of us by reading your articles. I really appreciate that. Yeah. That's been my, my lifelong effort yeah. is to take a really complex mm -hmm. subject, try to understand it, and try to share it with everybody so that mm -hmm. it can be understood. And um, it's something that we live here and we should all you know, understand where we live. Yes. We're, we're, right on, we're one of the creatures that live in Puget Sound. And we're just one of the creatures, <laughs> yes. Well, thank you for that. Actually, um, this act that's been introduced is about the, f the nat national government, the federal government, working more in touch with local, state, and tribal governments. And I'm, I'm wondering um, when the Puget Sound Partnership, uh, I've, I guess Kathy and both of you could talk a little bit about the Puget Sound pa Partnership, they have an action agenda. What is that, and um, what are some of the, the methods that they're recommending that we adopt? Well, I'll take a whack at that. Okay. Um, the Puget Sound Partnership decided that um, it should focus in three main areas. Um, shellfish, uh, being able to harvest and um, enjoy shellfish resources, both culturally and economically important to our region and for stormwater, which is mostly controlling the, um, the uh, uh, toxins going into Puget Sound and also to protect and, and, um, and, and maintain our water resources. And the third is habitat, which is uh, largely focused on Chinook, but um, Chinook salmon, which are um, the primary food of orca whales but to also look at other species that, and just to protect and restore habitat. Um, one of the uh, most scientifically accepted ways to um, maintain stability in ecosystems is to protect intact habitat um, rather than a particular species. So those are the three approaches within the action agenda. So it's stormwater, habitat, and shellfish yes. primarily that mm -hmm. we're looking at. And um, so what does the action agenda say about those? Does it, the, does it um, lay out prescriptions? <coughs> the intent of the action agenda is to um, bring together local, state, and federal um, experts and citizens to agree on, on strategic initiatives that are aligned. And the reason that the Puget Sound Partnership was, was created in um, 2007 or 2008 was because all of the state and federal and county and city organizations were doing their own part, but
but it wasn't coordinated and it wasn't aligned and it wasn't um, particularly effective to assume that people were doing the right actions. So the action agenda is intended to give uh, coordinated um, and, and scientifically supported um, actions so that a city can adopt capital improvement plans that align that um, that people can take care of their beaches in a way that, that help the health of the sound, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that reminds me that there are some vital signs that we measure that with. And I was just looking, this, uh, this document about the vital signs um, has a, a diagram mm -hmm. of what the vital signs are and some of the methods that we can be using. Could each of you talk a little bit about vital signs that you think are especially that you're especially knowledgeable about and or that you think are especially important? Well, um, we did a series of articles in the Kitsap Sun that focused on the action, um, the um, indicators. And um, it was a series that was divided into different kinds of species of concern and um, also uh, habitats. So. I'm trying to remember some of the significant ones. Um, protecting habitat probably for um, salmon is one of the indicators, mm -hmm. one of the vital signs. Um, trying to rebuild the salmon populations. The, the Chinook salmon is listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. And then I did mention before about killer whales. They're endangered. And their primary prey is the salmon. So two of the um, indicators are salmon and killer whales. And we're trying to rebuild those populations, you know, the effort. Um, there are many other ones. I think there's 23 altogether. But mm -hmm. um, those are kind of key ones for me. So you've written about orcas. We went through and, we, yeah, we wrote about all the, all the various yeah. uh, vital signs indicators. But why don't you just kind of drill down a little bit more and, and explain what, why they're um, at risk, the orcas? Um, well, there's th there are three main reasons they believe um, are the primary um, limiting factors. The problems that they face are the food supply. And it's interesting because you think with all the different kinds of salmon that they'd be um, interested in just eating, but they favor Chinook. It's the way that they've evolved through thousands of years and um, they do not eat seals or sea lions as the transient whales do, so they don't, don't compete with them. Mm -hmm. So food is one of the main problems. They've also got um, toxic chemicals in their, blood, in their blubber mm -hmm. and in their bloodstream at some of the highest levels in the world, the ones that we have right here. And that's because of all the industry we've had in Puget Sound through the years, and they've picked that up by eating the fish which are contaminated as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then um, the third one is the interference from people like boats that go out and um, make a lot of noise and we've got a lot more ship traffic. So um, interference and noise by humans is the third major mm -hmm. factor for the killer whales. So trying to, the National Marine Fisheries Service, which is mandated to um, follow these um, whales and try to solve the problems um, have been studying each of those issues and trying to figure out how we can reduce the problem. So they've increased the distance that boats can be from the mm -hmm. whales and they're working on the food supply and also trying to reduce the toxic chemicals that are found mm -hmm. in the sediments. Mm -hmm. So do we know where some are the toxins? I mean there, there was a lot of, of industry years ago that was probably even more difficult than what we have now. Have we changed our patterns at all in terms of um, putting toxins into Yeah, it itself? appears that the, um, the amount that's going out is dramatically different from what it was years and years ago. But the sediments still contain some of these and they kind of get stirred around and they're still in the mm -hmm. um, food web. Mm -hmm. So they still get picked up by the, the herring, which are eaten by the salmon, which are eaten by the whales. So they're still in the food web. And also, whales live about the same length of time that humans do. Their lifespans are fairly long. So that a lot of them have lived in this toxic soup for a long time. And they've picked up um, this in their blubber. And it's not easy to get rid of once it's in mm -hmm. your fat cells. 
it does seem like something then that we should definitely be working on. Um, I mean, it's, it's really hard to remove it from mm -hmm. the sediment. And yet, um, if it's that harmful, eventually it will be harmful to us as well. Mm -hmm. I might point out that it, people were really worried the last couple of years because there were no whales being born. Mm -hmm. And people were trying to figure out why the heck has this happened? Why aren't they being born? Why are they dying at a young age? Mm -hmm. And something has happened in the last um, year, a little bit more than a year, we've had nine births. Yes. And it's quite amazing and nobody really knows why, but it's worth um, investigating and trying to understand, well, if things went wrong before what is going right now. And one of the speculation is the um, Chinook runs are a little bit higher off the Columbia River and maybe these oh. whales are eating more and eating better off the coast. So are you, is someone t tracking the time that they spend there versus someplace else? Are they actually lingering Yes, in that they, area? they're measuring where they go and uh, how long they spend time and try to figure out where their important habitat is. Mm -hmm. And when the federal government declared critical habitat, they did so in Puget Sound proper. And since for the last five years, they've been studying that they actually go into the ocean and it may be that that's um, is important, if not more important than Puget Sound. So off the Columbia River and Grays Harbor and these other areas, mm -hmm. they are um, finding out how long the whales are living there and um, maybe protecting those areas as well. That's, to be, that's coming up. Oh, good. That's a really good pointer for those of us who are in decision-making roles. We should, be, we should know that. Mm -hmm. I also love the, the fact that um, obviously you care a lot about um, the food web, and um, you've written a great deal, as I said, about um, orcas. So there seems to be a certain amount of passion for you <laughs> in that particular mammal. Is that it, or is it just the research aspects that have drawn you to it? Well, it's everything. Um, it was, I don't know if everybody remembers it, but back in 1997, we had... Um, I do. 19 killer whales came into Dye's Inlet. Mm -hmm. And they stayed for an entire month, which and is almost unheard of. show-offs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and these were the fish-eating ones, so they don't usually stay around too long in one mm -hmm. place. And here they were for a whole month. And it was during that time that I first became really aware of them and, and I've been following them from them. But that was my big introduction, to spend a month with the whales, being out on the water with the researchers and just being able to kind of get the feeling of what they are. And they're a very unique um, creature that communicates to each other and um, shares food. And they've got a social family that is um, similar to elephants, you know, matriarchal society led by the, mm -hmm. the uh, oldest female in the group. And um, the pods are actually family groups that are joined together. So, um, yeah, just knowing how closely related we are in some ways. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you for telling us <laughs> about that. That's really nice mm -hmm. to know. Um, I also remember at that time, uh, we, we were so excited to see them that many people did take their boats out and, and spent a lot of time way too close to them and so it was hard to control them i mean people yeah. we tried to give advice because dyes inlet is so close that mm -hmm. i enjoyed being on the shore and watching them as much as mm -hmm. anything else but um people just you know couldn't restrain themselves from getting close as they could so there was one weekend when we had 500 boats yeah. on dyes inlet and that was more than they'd ever seen before trying to all watch the same small group of whales so um if they do come back at some point, I hope people, you know, will figure out a way that they can watch from shore or at least try to constrain that impact because that is, they are an endangered species, which means they might not be around 100 years from now. They might be gone if we're not careful. And when the whales were here, it was before they were listed. Correct. So are this, this ad that being listed as an endangered species under the Endangered Species Act gives more clout to... Um, um, to law enforcement, mm -hmm. to, to, to following up with uh, making it illegal to um, harass a whale, which is, <coughs> it, it, uh, it's called take in the official uh, Endangered Species Act language. And that means anything, it, it, you, you think it means killing, but it means um, looking at them sideways, um, you know, interfering with harassing their food, them. 
harassing them mm -hmm. in any way. And so I suspect that if we had them in Dyes Inlet again, that it would, we'd have NOAA and other um, federal officers making sure that people mm -hmm. weren't harassing them. It's they were protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, yeah. which meant you weren't supposed to harass them. But um, they're even more careful now. Mm -hmm. Actually, after that weekend with so many, the Board of Commissioners also passed. I remember. <laughs> Oh, or, uh, yeah. I covered that. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um, well, we've talked about the vital signs, and we actually, I, I think we've followed um, <coughs> the, the, the chain just a little bit. Actually, I do want to point out, too, that I enjoyed looking at the website to look at some of the articles that you've written, and the, the, the uh, food web was an especially beautiful site because of the illustrations um, to show the different uh, creatures that are in the food web, but also um, just the beautiful art that displayed that. I, I would hope that that would become more um, commonly available and, and, and viewed because it is something that's very instructive. And, and um yeah, that was the series we called Taking the Pulse of Puget Sound. Yes. So it's available f if other people want to read it. It's online. Okay. And it's, um, unlike some of the articles, that one is free. You, anybody can get it. So. Super. So, um, Kathy, we haven't pulled you into this conversation very much. You um, staff some of the local integrating organizations, uh, which I sit on the West Sound one, and we also have the Hood Canal one that Kitsap County is on. What are some of the near, what's called near-term actions that you've been working on, and, and what, what is their purpose? So the near-term actions are, um, first of all, back to the action agenda. There uh -huh. are broad actions that would make um, Puget Sound more diggable, swimmable, fishable, which is another term that was coined in the d development of that agency. Um, but the, the idea is that, um, that if we can rely on locals to come together and identify the, the actions that can be done within the next two years and provide them to the scientists at the Puget Sound Partnership to be reviewed, that, um, that these would provide a, a, a guide to federal, state, and local jurisdictions on what they should be investing in. So in the, in the West Central Local Integrating Organization, for instance, um, one of the near-term actions that was put forth was to do farm management in a particular watershed to upgrade the shellfish harvest in that bay mm -hmm. nearby. That <coughs> is um, a, a conservation district and um, health district. And then they bring in uh, nonprofits like the Puget Sound Restoration Fund that would come in and, and put in native oysters that again would be s supplementing. So it's all the partners coming together agreeing this is where we think there should be funding. And it's scientifically based and it's measurable. So, um, so this is something that you can do in two years and see if it works. And if it does, then continue with those near-term actions. Some of the other near-term actions we have are um, um, some septic system um, upgrades and loans to private citizens and, and retrofitting stormwater is a huge one where jurisdictions like the city of Paulsbo and the city of Bremerton want to know, you know wh where should we be targeting those actions. So, and, and also salmon recovery. What, what are the important rivers and stocks of fish that we should be protecting and enhancing here? Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, you two both ha each have encyclopedic knowledge of natural resources and environmental issues that are really valuable to the rest of us. Kitsap County was recently uh, named a national water trail. What could we be doing to help people who are going out on the water and celebrating the fact that we have this wonderful um, method of transportation and sightseeing um, that would help them see what they're, know what they're seeing and be wise uh, in that environment? You want to talk about the water trail? You go mm -hmm. ahead. Well, I can talk a little bit about the water trail is okay. where um, people can um, kayak. We've got one of the longest shorelines in the state, and people should enjoy that. We've got inlets where people can, um, can come in and see seals. 
uh, quite common, um, birds of all kinds. And um, there's little way, way stop over points on the water trail. And I'd also like to point out that you don't have to be on the water to enjoy um, our habitat. We've got lots of trails um, around. And um, one of the things that I try to keep up to date on is where you can see salmon. And I've put out a map of all of the public viewing spots, well, not all of them, but the, some of my favorite ones anyway, <laughs> where you can go out to the edge of the road or a bridge or um, some private um, property where the permission has been given to see salmon. And um, the map actually shows where, um, you know, some of the best viewing spots where you can see salmon swim by. And of course, you know, one of the best ones is the Chico mm -hmm. area. And um, that's a county park that's just been developed for the purpose of viewing salmon. So it's really a wonderful place to be able to go. And uh, in the fall when the salmon are running, I hope everybody can, you know, that's our background. That's our backyard. And um, we, we can enjoy that. And you'll remind us again. We, we do. We, put the, we try to put the map out if we can, or at least remind people in the paper that it's there. And then my blog, I always put that on my blog. So, um, I, I think that one of the most intriguing um, uses of, in a, of, of having a water trail is we're starting to get a lot more interested citizen scientists. And for instance, um, the growth of, uh, of vegetation along our shoreline, bulk kelp, and um, eelgrass in particular um, have declined and are really important for, um, for just the diversity of, of life in Puget Sound. You can be in a kayak and be um, photographing and documenting where the, eel, where the bull kelp um, beds are um, in, a, in a way that the state and the locals don't have the capacity to do. And um, bringing children out on the water to, to um, show them the beauty. Uh, uh, if you haven't sat in a kayak uh, or even been on a dock and enjoyed the, the beauty of Puget Sound, um, I'd be surprised. And children, in particular, um, are going to be our, our future in protecting and restoring our sound. It looks beautiful now. It is in trouble. And we need to make sure that our youngest citizens um, have a, a, an appreciation. So I just think, that, you know, just that connection with the beauty of, of the water and the seabirds and the sea life is, is something that is, um, just as you described with the orcas, um, surmounts all, all other sorts of um, concerns for, um, you know, the, the politics and other things associated and with it. And you were talking earlier about shellfish as being mm -hmm. one of the priorities. And we've got lots of public shellfish beaches mm -hmm. in our area. You can actually go out and dig clams and gather oysters if you pick the right time of year and um, you know follow all the rules. But um, that's that's something that we can take advantage of is some of our own bounty. We take care of the resources, yes, clean up the water, and we can then um, benefit by using those public beaches where those things are available. Indeed, we can, and indeed we do and have. Um, I believe our national congressmen are correct mm -hmm. when they say Puget Sound is a national treasure. And you have helped make the, the case for that statement. So thank you again so much for being here today. You're I really appreciate the wisdom thank that you. each of you has brought. And thank you for joining us today. We'll see you again next time.